Welcome to the All Things Endurance podcast. My name is Rick Prince. I am your host, and I'm excited to have James Jenkowitz on the podcast today. James and I go back a long way. We worked together for quite a few years at a corporate fitness center. Uh, in the evenings, he would teach me some self-defense things, which is the whole purpose of this podcast today. So, uh, Unfortunately, you know, we hear in the news more often than not, at least, you know, once a month, uh, unfortunately, about something unfortunate happened, you know, often to women out on a run, um, you know, again, off, often it's just very tragic news. So I felt that talking to someone like James would be incredibly important uh, for our listeners to understand what to do if, if hopefully, you know, hopefully not, but if they are in these situations, uh, what to do about it. So James, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Rick. It's always a pleasure being with you. Yeah, After looking... we were separated from New York so many years ago. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Like, like I said, you know, uh, you know, James, you know, you and I, you would talk to me about this stuff at work, and then uh, yeah. sometimes at the end of the day, you know, we go on the wrestling mats that they had there that people use to stretch on, and you know, you basically beat me up for five or ten minutes, <laughs> and and you know, that was how we'd end our day, and you'd explain kind of why you kicked my butt. So, uh, like, Rick, look what I learned today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. So going going a bit further than that, maybe uh, it, it would be helpful for you to discuss your background, your personal background as far as self defense, martial arts, all that kind of stuff. How how you came to to learn all the stuff that we're going to talk about during this podcast? Absolutely, and I appreciate the opportunity to do this and share this information with you and your your team and your crew because it is it's important to everybody. But you guys are in a particular particular type of situation where you are out as an endurance athlete, sometimes out for long times by yourself and you're under stress because you've been training for hours and hours. So this type of information is going to be very germane for you. And to your point, yes, unfortunately you hear these stories come up all the time about the female who was attacked when she was running and that kind of thing. So uh, real quick, my story goes back to when I was probably like 15 or 16 and I started taking a wide variety of martial arts and I continued th throughout decades. And, you know, interestingly enough, it did spawn for anybody who's old enough, who's ever seen the movie First Blood. Uh, that movie intrigued me enough to read the book. And I remember in the book, there was a passage, for those of you who know the story, uh, where the sheriff is teasing Rambo and kind of pushing him. And... Rambo's thinking in his head at one point, I'm paraphrasing, but this is what he's thinking in his head. He's looking at the sheriff and thinking, you know, you dumb hick, like you have no idea that in 15 seconds, I could break your leg in two sections and smash your Adam's apple into sauce. And I was thinking even at that age, okay, where do I learn that? <laughs> where, 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 you know, that, that wasn't being taught in anything I was taking. Right. And so it piqued my interest that there was this like military type of um, training and so I, like a lot of people, started that journey of fighting. And yes, a lot of different types of martial arts. They were all great. I learned a lot of amazing things. You learn athleticism, you learn timing, you learn coordination, uh, you learn amazing social skills through fighting and like really how to navigate yourself through, you know, social situations appropriately and not resorting to violence. There's so many good things that came from it. But I, and I think I speak for a lot of people, still didn't have all my questions answered. I was still struggling. I was still like, okay, so I know how to do many amazing katas and I know how to tie my gi really well, but I didn't really know. I didn't have the confidence that if the proverbial beep hit the hit the fan, uh, would I have all the skills necessary to to handle it, you know, one on one or multiple attackers or somebody with a weapon. And everything I studied did involve weapons, you know, did involve multiple attackers, right? But I studied just enough to be confused. <laughs> There's almost like a, it was almost like an advantage to sticking with one system. But it wasn't until right around 2000 that a bunch of guys I know where we used to work at the um, the wellness center in um, New York City asked me to uh, film and to review this guy that was coming in from Las Vegas who was doing a um, a training for them. Uh, none of these guys had any background in martial arts. And they're like, hey, just why don't you come along? And you, we'd really be curious about your feedback on this guy. You know, he comes from uh, military intelligence and he has a really extensive background. And, you know, we'd just be curious to see what you have to say about this. And I knew 
five minutes in to his presentation, literally five minutes in, this is what I've been looking for. Mm. I had spent a lot of time, and again, I, I don't regret any of the time, but I'd spent a lot of time in what I uh, consider storefront dojos, you know, uh, martial arts, strip mall, martial arts kind of thing. And, um, you know, they always have the Taekwondo place and then the pizzeria right next to it. And <laughs> it hasn't really changed since the eighties. Um, so a lot of that. And, but it wasn't until I watched this gentleman perform and teach that I was like, this is, uh, an amalgamation of th the very first question I had at like 15 years old. And it was a very unapologetic, non-gratuitous approach to understanding violence. And I'd never, I always felt like I was being taught, talked to about the topic of violence in an honest and forthright way for the first time. Hmm. You know, not in a way to just string me along to get another bell to go to the next level in this system or that system. And I just recognized it because I'd been through so many different martial arts and I've had a variety of my own personal experiences at that time, you know, um, like any young dumb person does, right? <laughs> you find yourself <laughs> in trouble and you, and you get into situations, but it was, um, that's where it really, um, solidified itself for me. And then I stuck to this guy like white on rice. And then I trained with him. I was fortunate enough to train with him relentlessly for a decade or so. And that's the time that I started teaching you and other people. And as you know, where we were working, uh, it, it grew, the self-defense community grew. And then they were sending me to other corporate sites in New York city. And then it just expanded. Then next thing you know, I'm, um, teaching, um, security, uh, division people. And then eventually one thing leads to another and I'm working with some FBI guys and you know, the whole thing just kind of expanded from that point on. Uh, in addition to that, I was also a, a master tactical instructor for a non-lethal defense technique. I got certified in that. And that was just the opposite. You know, that was all mm. pain compliance. And that's the kind of stuff you use, you know, as a bouncer and, and those kind of things, you know, it's just like, as long as somebody's in a lot of pain and they comply. So I, I had that whole spectrum of basic pain compliance to all the way to escalating to maim, crippling or killing another human being. And that's, that's the spectrum, you know, and, and that's what I stuck with for a long time and kept refining it. And I still teach it today under the inner athlete training modicum, because that's um, my fitness brand. And so that's one of the offerings I teach under that. But what really changed for me again, was the fact that they weren't, um, they weren't really teaching you any type of parlor tricks. They were teaching you things that really had impact the kind of things that you can't really just go home and, you know, say, Hey honey, let, you know, here, grab my wrist. <laughs> you know? And then like, you know, it was the kind of thing that if you executed any of it, one of you would wind up in the hospital. Right. So it, that that's the intrigue it had for me. And I found it for all the years that I've been teaching self-defense, it was like that body of information that just made what I taught so much more uh, tight. Um, and that's why you found like one good four hour session you know, could really teach people very useful things as soon as they walk out of that class, which is something that I was looking for in Aikido, Aikido Jiu Jitsu, Shotogun Karate, regular Karate, Taekwondo, um, Northern Shaolin Kung Fu, you know, all the styles that I'd studied, uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu, all great styles, but still had that lingering doubt. And it was this system that just sort of stripped that doubt away. Yeah. Well, well it's interesting. I mean, you know, even though I guess in, in totality, you and I didn't spend that much time, you know, really doing this or talking about it, it was still, you know, quite a few hours we did this together um, in, in totality. And even then, you know, not really having an interest in this stuff and not really, I guess, caring for lack of a better word, at least initially, it, it, it I immediately understood the impact of it and how it was different and, and how it could be extremely valuable. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have this podcast, because if someone like myself could understand that um, pretty much right from the get go, sort of like you did when, when you were tasked with, you know, uh, you know, with the video um, of that guy, you know, that's pretty impactful stuff. So I think that's a good segue in, into the next one, as far as like, 
So how, you know, you mentioned how this is different, but how is it truly different from these other forms of self-defense you studied and why, in your opinion, when it, not as far as like, you know, sport, karate for sport, but when it comes purely to self-defense, when it's, you know, you can't run away and you have to deal with the situation, why is what we're going to talk about today, you consider the best, the best method or the best way of dealing with a, a situation? Right. <clears throat> no, it's a great question. And, um, Best is a tenuous word, you know, but it's, sure. uh, I feel it has a lot of validity and a lot of grounding because of its effectiveness. And I'll just explain that a little bit. When you, when, whenever you're in any type of martial arts component, uh, you, like I said, you learn a lot of great things, but you're always in a rules based environment. Mm. So there are certain things you can and can't do. Even in UFC, there's, I think, a list of like north of 20 things you can't do. Okay. So this curriculum would teach you those 20 things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> and how to do them uh, with the greatest impact. Right. So when you train, you're using somebody's body, just you're not training, you're not hitting them, you're not punching, you're not sparring, you're learning the targets on the body, you know, and, and how to exact a response from that. So let me go just a little bit into the history of it. And it goes all the way back to World War II intelligence. Uh, there were two gentlemen named Applegate and Fairbarns. And they were tasked with uh, redesigning closed quarter hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, and there was a whole body of information that they amassed <clears throat> that eventually found its way into the United States military community. And what the, what the information really focused on was not so much technique, right? What it really focused on was uh, blunt trauma to the body. Like, how is that best exploited? And they had to go in with the condition that all the advantages of speed, strength, mobility have been dissolved under the fatigue of warfare. Mm. So no matter how good you may look in a dojo and no matter how great your swinging back kick may look, you know, barefoot, right? None of that translates when you've been hiking for five days, you have 90 pounds on your back, you're dehydrated, you haven't slept, right? All your athletic speed, all your athletic prowess has completely gone away. So what do you do then? You know, what, like, how do you become a, a lethal machine, even under the most um, duress situations? So it really came down to just understanding the anatomy and then how to best exploit the anatomy. Mm -hmm. And then realizing that you don't need a lot of, you know, there's always going to be somebody who's bigger, faster, stronger, you know, no matter who you are in whatever domain. So there's no being that guy at the top, right? But you can learn how the body works uh, the nervous system, the afferent, efferent response, nervous system responses, and how to best exploit those. And those are, they're systems of the body that nobody can defend against. Right? So the, like, no matter how big you are, how much you go to the gym, your throat is exposed. And it's an extraordinarily vulnerable part of the body. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't take a lot. It takes just one good shot to the throat, you know, to, to, to crush a trachea. Right. You have the vagus nerves going through the side of the neck. These are all targets. Um, ears, you know, just knowing how to slap an ear and you don't need to practice slapping an ear. If you can clap really loud, you can already slap an ear. So it's knowing that even under the most fatiguing situations, you still have this advantage. If you know how to use your body weight, if you understand the parts of the anatomy that you're going after, um, you just put those two things together, all your body weight make find one or two targets that are available to you at the time make those targets your universe and once you've done that and this is the thing that makes the real difference is you've created an injury in the person right so you haven't punched them and they're like ow right you, you've hit them in a vulnerable part and now they are rendered dysfunctional because they have an, an actual injury so when you injure the human being through the tool of violence and that's the vernacular that um I was trained in using, right? So it's, it's understanding that violence is a tool that's just as much at your disposal as it is the predator's disposal. We have an impulse to stigmatize this stuff, right? We have an impulse to say, well, that's only the domain of the bad guy. Only the bad guy would use violence. I'm a good guy. I don't use violence. Uh, you don't know. You know, you, you don't know until you're in, in that position, you know, where you're going to be or how you're going to, you know, respond to those situations. So understanding that violence almost, the term violence has a lot of gravitas to it socially, 
I understand, and it should. But by the same token, you have to understand it's just as accessible to you as it is to the person um, who might be looking to attack you. And I'm a history buff, as you know, too, and um, background in philosophy and all that kind of stuff. And I think what, what's helpful to sort of understand here is there's a physical application, but there's the mindset. And a big part of the mindset is really looking at, if you look at history, for example, there's some historians that say, if you really want to understand it, look at it through the eyes of the, the perpetrator, right? Try to look at it through Hitler's eyes, through Stalin's eyes, through Pol Pot's eyes, right? And the the insight you get would be pretty interesting. And this is what I kind of teach in the system. If you could look at it through the attacker's eyes, and then you can flip yourself to actually be that person and do those things, you, you're looking at it from a completely different paradigm. So now it's no longer somebody attacking you, you're assuming the role of the victim. You realize that you have just as many tools and resources, even if you don't have a weapon. Like there are just so many ways you can use your body to affect change and uh, do irreparable damage to another human being. And it doesn't matter how big you are. It doesn't matter how big, how small, um, because when you really know how to use your body weight, no guy, even if it's Arnold Schwarzenegger, and let's say he's being attacked by a 90 pound um, person, nobody's going to want 90 pounds of anything going into their throat, yeah. going into their bladder, going into their kidneys, going into their testicles, like going into all the parts that are most vulnerable to us. And like I said, you can't insulate that. You can't train that in the gym to insulate yourself from that kind of trauma and that kind of damage. So what makes it different is it's not really a rules-based system in as so much as it's a almost like an academic um, undertaking in understanding trauma to the body. For example, on average, how many degrees of hyperextension does a joint generally have to go before it breaks? You know, and then how do we how do we exploit that? Exactly how far does something, a thumb or some other object have to go to an eyeball in order to enucleate it? Right. So it's it's understanding these kind of things. And you'd be surprised that it's pretty easy to do this once you get past the, you know, the psychology of it yeah. and the psychology. You know, it's it's one thing for us to have this discussion now and to practice these things in a safe environment of a class or to watch the digital product that we're going to create. Right. But it's a different game when it's really happening. Sure. You know, sure. so you, you might be surprised at what you're capable of you yeah. know, in those kind of situations, especially if you have a child, you know, who you're trying to protect or a family member or, so, or, or another loved one. Yeah, You might already have the proclivity to go berserk. And what you would learn here is just how to be very precise and how to use <laughs> all that adrenaline yeah. to go in, literally like taking the screwdriver to the, um, the, the glass you know, yeah. and it's doing that little screw in with that kind of precision and understanding the targeting of the body and taking all that force and energy and going into those targets with that kind of attention. Yeah. And you'd be shocked at how quickly you could end something because you've injured somebody. Yeah. Again, it, you didn't ouch them. Right. And and nothing you teach, we teach in the system is can necessarily be ca countered. Mm -hmm. Right. Because violence can't be countered. Right. Violence is, is violence. It's, it's a baseball bat to the side of the head. Yeah. You know, it's a um, it's a rock to the side of the head. It's it's a heel stomp to the throat when the person's lying down. It's a one way street. Violence is not two way. General rules based fighting is two ways. Yeah. You know, there's a block. There's a defend. There's a block. There's a defend. But, you know, when, when you look at it through these eyes, it's, it's a completely different narrative. It's just yeah. violence. And it's something that's wired in us. Like we just have been doing this since day one. It's, you know, whether we were trying to steal somebody's. Uh, food land you know whatever and the last thing i'll say because i know we have more questions is just um the people who have been most successful at this rarely have any background in this at all yeah right they haven't trained this way they they just had the intent at that moment for whatever reason you know to pick up the knife to pick up the bottle to pick up the uh the tire iron and just smash somebody yeah you know and they just they just got it done and that's what in this particular field of study, that's how we learn, you know, it's, it's prison security footage. It's seven 11 parking lot security footage. It's, it's looking at like who is gruesome as it looks 
it, when you look at it academically, you're not looking and turning away like, oh, that's gross. You're, you're trying to look at it critically and being like, who won and why? Mm -hmm. Like, why was one person successful and the other person not? Right. And when you really start to look at it through those eyes, you really gain a completely different perspective on it all. Yeah. And yeah, again, I remember during our during our talks, you know, I mean, yeah, I think to the to the normal human, right? Hearing things to the normal person, hearing things like stomping on someone's throat or doing whatever, some, you know, something that will be considered ultraviolet. It's not normal, right? It's not something it's that not you and but I think the thing that all of our listeners have to appreciate is, yeah, clearly you don't go around doing that every day. But if you're in a situation, it's where it's either essentially you or them or something is, you know, seriously bodily harm or death could come to you. That's when you utilize these tools. And um, and I think, and I, again, I remember one of the things that stuck with me when we were talking about this, um, you know, way back when was that so many people think, well, this person is coming at me and, you know, they, they sort of put it in this, like, look, they wouldn't be doing these horrible things if they were just a normal human. And they thought like, you know, yeah. like you basically, for lack of a better word, I, I, if I remember correctly, I'm paraphrasing, you basically have to get down to their level, like what you were saying and, and kind of approach it from their mindset. Look, they don't have a problem smashing me over the head with a bottle. So what am I going to do then? Like me just, you know, giving them an ouchie, as you said, and punching them on the shoulder is not going to do the trick. So, so I think, it, I think so much of it, as far as understanding this concept of violence, as you put it really is a mental shift to be able to kind of wrap your head around it. A hundred percent. And I remember having this very conversation with you, we were talking yeah. about the ATM machine. Yeah. Right? So you're getting money out of the ATM machine. Somebody holds a gun or a knife and you're thinking, well, all right, if I just give them the money, it'll go away. And maybe that'll work, right? I'm not saying don't do that, right? But I'm just saying you also have to understand that you're imposing your value system, your moral yes. ethics, your understanding of life and how you socialize through this world uh, through your eyes. And you're, you're hoping that imposing that and agreeing with them will get you out of the situation. And again, maybe it will, right? I'm not saying it won't. But you also have to be careful because you wouldn't be holding somebody up at the ATM to begin with. Right. <laughs> right. So, so this person right. has already sort of like uh, transgressed those boundaries, those yeah. social boundaries that we've uh, really established. And as you know, so much of our dialogue is visual. You know, it's like 75 percent of how we communicate is visual. Right. Yeah. So it's the to the sociopathic predator. Like they don't go for those cues. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're at the ATM machine. The next thing you know, you open your eyes and you're looking up at somebody above you because you were knocked out. Yeah. Right. These are the kind of people, the, the kind of people you're learning to um, fight in these situations, not defend. We could talk about that in a second, but um, really constitute the sociopath who is really probably less than 1% of the population, but that's still mm. millions of people. Yeah. And it's, it's those kind of people who could stick a knife in you and walk away and sleep like a baby and not think twice about it. Sure. That you're, you're learning how to, um, protect yourself against yeah no it's, it's right. such an important it's such an important distinction and if i could just say this too the reason i'm careful about not using the word defend and that's why i don't even like to call the workshop self-defense i like to call it self-protection but basically because words matter and yep. the second you say defend you've already put yourself in a position where you're the one being attacked mm. right so yeah you, ne you never you don't even want to use those words you know in a real life or death situation you know, you're never defending anything. It already puts you behind the, the, the eight ball in terms of what's going on in that particular situation. Got you it. are always, always attacking. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, that's, yeah. The words do matter. That's, that's a, that's a very important distinction. Yeah. So we don't use the words defend. We don't use block. We don't, you know, it's just, you're either injuring the person or you're not. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, it's like the star Wars character. Mm -hmm. Oh, I forget who's the little green character who, who had the, 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 um, Yoda Yoda. Yes. Who had the thing about try, right? oh, yeah. try and not try. Right. Yeah. It's either you're getting it done or you're not getting it done. There's yeah. no in between. Right. There's no, there's no trying. Right. Yeah. So that's that, now every time I think about this stuff, I'm going to think of Yoda beating me. Yoda. Up yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that doesn't like, give you nightmares. <laughs> yes, it probably will. <laughs> Wake um, up in a cold sweat. I dreamed that Yoda was stabbing me to death. <laughs> <laughs> so so I guess that, again, that's a good sort of way to, to move on to the next question. So of this model um, of, um, you, you know, that we're talking about, what are some of the most important aspects of this model of, of attacking? 
when you say aspects, like the, the, the most important things to remember, to recall? Yeah, I, I would say the most important things. Yeah, uh, things that... Um, if a yeah for a listener what are the most short of um trying to yeah trying to think of the yeah we'll go more this. into this deeper into the digital product but the, the real takeaway is it's never about what's happening to you okay because that's where people get stuck okay somebody puts them in an arm bar you know or a bear hug and they lift them up and they do that kind of stuff right and then you get very defensive and then you're thinking okay how do i get out of this right whereas what we, we would teach an effect is okay, boom, I know where their arms are. I know where their legs are, right? I know they're fully conscious. I know I'm fully conscious. If they really wanted me out, this was a really, really bad attempt to do that, right? So it's about not thinking about what's being done to you. Boom, you're in that position now. Now it's yours. It's like, what can I now do to them? Got it, right? okay. I still have my hands available. I still have my legs available. I may be a little tight right now because they have me in a bear hug, but I still have lots of things at my disposal that I can use in, a, in any given second okay. to, to wreak damage on them. Like once, once you understand the anatomy and where the targets are and what to expect when you hit them successfully, then it really just became, becomes like a game in, in effect. It's, it's whack-a-mole. Yeah. <laughs> like, boom this target because you're not going to hit your first couple targets like the likelihood of you hitting them successfully is kind of rare and that's why you just keep learning targets 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 because once you hit one successfully and you've um produced an injury in the person then it's it's game over you know so yeah that would be one big takeaway it's not about right. what's being done to you it's always about what you can do to them okay because Got a lot it. of people freeze at that one point sure Sure. You know. Because that's what's typically taught, right? Like if this happens, it's very situational specific, right? Like, okay, let's say a traditional self-defense model. Again, I'm just assuming someone puts you in a bear hug. Someone does this, someone does that. Okay. If you're in this way situation, do this. If you're in this situation, do that versus, versus have it be, you know, target focused. So like, okay, what do I have at my disposal? You know, based off of what I learned. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that plays into weapons also, right? If somebody happens to have a blade, like nothing changes, right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't automatically have to take a Filipino knife fighting course to know how to affect change if you have a knife uh, and you, you don't have to become a knife fighter, right? You get, you would still learn, use all the same principles, except now you have a weapon and the weapon can obviously do a lot more penetration, a lot more tissue damage than your bare fist can. Right. So net, net, nothing changes. It's not like you have to learn um, blunt weapons, projectile weapons, edge weapons it's not like you need to take separate courses and all these right because yeah, it's about the, the body right it's about it's about the body the, right and, the and i'll say this body. too rick it's about understanding what the threat is mm -hmm. right so when somebody and i'm not saying knives aren't intimidating like i have taken taken knife fighting courses right they, they are even archetypally they're just very very terrifying right but when you understand the threat at the end of the day when you have the presence of mind to understand the knife is not the problem Right. The problem is this person's ability to think. Mm -hmm. The problem is this person's ability to um, uh, do any kind of damage to me. The second I shut this part down, their ability, their their nervous system, as soon as I get enough injuries and then to capitulate, the knife is not a concern. But a more untrained mind like might look at the knife as something that needs to be disarmed. Sure. Right. So now I'm going to use knife fighting techniques to disarm that person. Right. And I'm not saying this stuff is easy psychologically to get over. I'm not saying guns aren't intimidating. Knives aren't intimidating. The, the um, blunt objects aren't intimidating. Right. But it's having the presence of the mind and having done enough training to realize what the real threat is. And the real threat is always the operator, not yeah. the weapon. Got it. Because if you start fighting for the weapon, then it becomes who's bigger, faster, stronger. Mm -hmm. And that person wins. Yeah. If it's about taking out the operator, then you learn all the tools to do that, whether you have a weapon in your hand or not. Got it. Yeah, those are those are two definitely uh, important distinctions. Um, so, th the best possible thing is not not getting yourself in these situations in the first place, right? And yeah. and some things just happen, but certainly you can put yourself in in harm's way by putting yourself, you know, knowingly or unknowingly in in some sort of unsafe condition. So, knowing that this is an endurance sports. Uh, specific podcast, endurance sports, specific demographic. 
what are some areas, I mean, you're a runner, you've been a runner for a long time. Um, and even though you know all this information, what are some marathoner. things? Yeah, marathoner. <laughs> what are some things that you would tell the listeners of this podcast probably to avoid, you know, if, if possible, avoid as okay, far as so environments? I'm going to take it one step back and just talk about a broader topic, the idea of social versus asocial violence. Okay. And again, like I said before, we socialize ourselves a lot visually right and and there's always this tendency when you see two guys flare out their lats you know or, or they, they pound their chest or drag their knuckles on the ground or you know the, these are the iconic images of um of don't invade my territory right so that's social there's something social about that right you could maybe stare at somebody and guys do this all the time you know it, it's like guys have this sort of like informal nod even if they're just like walking past each other with their significant others, you know, there's this tendency to look them in the eye and say, you know, Hey man, that's good. You know, there, there's this like social way of saying like, everything's cool. Right. And if everything's not cool, we have ways of looking at each other in a way that just sort of like, okay, back off a little bit. Right. We have all these social cue cues. So that would be the domain of um, social violence for lack of a better word. Right. Two guys in a bar who are going at it for, you know, five or 10 minutes. You know, think of the film like Roadhouse and that kind of thing, right? You um, you have two guys who either um, really don't know what they're doing or on some level don't really want to hurt each other. You know, they're out on a Saturday night and they've been drinking and they're, they, they don't want any damage, but they have all this alpha male aggression that's coming out in this alcohol-induced environment, right? And I would even say that falls under the, the realm of social. Right. And and hopefully nobody gets seriously hurt. They shake it off. They buy each other a beer and, you know, life goes on. Um, a social is just the opposite. A social is the predator we talked about who comes up to you and puts the knife in the back of the neck. Right. And then walks away and doesn't think twice about it. So understanding those two domains is important. And that lays the foundation for the question you were just asking you know, how do I avoid these situations to begin with? Yeah. Right? There is, I mean, I have a lot of background in this, right? But I will be the first to bow down and wash somebody's feet to avoid a fight. Right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> because it's like, I, I understand what's at stake. I understand um, the emotional aspect. I know how quickly it can all go wrong. I know how easy it is. And we all know this on some level um, that even if you don't really want to hurt the person, you might just push them to quote, teach them a lesson. And then they could easily trip over something, crack their head open, you know, and now you have a fatal, you know, fatal accident. Sure. Even though it wasn't your intention. So the whole idea is to never cross that line to begin with when it comes to a social environment. There's no reason to get out of your car if somebody, you know, stole your parking spot, right? There is no reason to just not walk away, even if somebody's saying inappropriate things to your girlfriend or something, right? It's just like, it's just easier just to walk away and just get yourself out of the environment. And I don't know, you, you probably remember this. I don't know if a lot of your viewers would remember this, but there was a great show called Cops. And again, it becomes another, there's a sensational aspect to it, but it becomes another learning moment, right? Because when you really look at it from a certain perspective, you realize, hey, there were half a dozen to a dozen opportunities where this could have quelled. Yeah. But you see it escalate and escalate and escalate and escalate. So when emotions run high for whatever reason, and when there's alcohol involved or drugs involved, um, when men are younger, certainly in their adolescence, like all these things are just time bombs for things to go wrong. So keeping a cool head just understanding that no fight is worth it. And the only reason you're ever going to fight somebody is if you are really in a life or death situation, you know, that's how you avoid it on the 30,000 foot level. Got it. You know? Got it. Um, it's just understanding that difference between what's social and what's asocial. Yeah. Now for, for the, you know, for the, for the long distance runner, for the yeah. long distance cyclist, um, you know, I need to go out and get my 20 mile run in. Um, I have two options, either go on that, that beautiful trail in the woods where it's peaceful and I can hear birds singing, 
or, you know, run on the sidewalk next to I-25 out here and just hear trucks honking all day. But I know there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of people on that route, you know, so, you know, so there's, it, I'm not isolated versus, versus the other one versus the other trail. I'm yeah. isolated, but it's a much more enjoyable experience overall. As a, again, I'm not sure if this is a question, I'm sort of springing this on you. I'm not sure if this is a question that you can really answer or provide uh, guidance on, but if you were an athlete and you had those two choices, um, especially if you're a female, because again, that's what we hear in the news so much, unfortunately, these days, um, what would be your, what would be your advice to this, to this athlete? Just look at the history of the trail that you're on, you know, okay. does it have a legacy of people being attacked? Um, you know, one person in the last 20 years, probably not the big a deal, you know, but I'd say if there were one or two incidences in the last three years or so, you know, you might want to rethink that. Yep. Um, going with a partner is always a good idea. Like if you sure. can't find somebody who can keep up with you, maybe because I did this in my marathon training, um, not everybody could run with me, but I would, they can bring a bike with you, right? Yep. With them, right? They can cycle along with you. Um, having some sort of wearable where you could contact somebody you know, out in the woods. Now, here's the thing with you guys, with all endurance athletes, you fall into the parameters that they actually designed these type of techniques for when it came to the military. Because like we said earlier, that um, all your advantages of speed, strength, size, agility all disappear. Yeah. And it's no different from the endurance yeah, athlete. Because you're exhausted. You're yeah, you're exhausted. And if you've been out there for three or four year, uh, years, if you've been out there for three or four <laughs> That hours, is a long run. That's a long run. Uh, three or four hours, you know, training and it's it's really hot out and you're dehydrated. You know, you're not going to be at the, at the top of your game, right? So that's where you just have to understand that even a 90 pound female runner, again, it goes back to what we talked about before, when you know how to strike with all your body weight, you can still impact change even under extreme exhaustion. Yeah. Right. Because you're not going into a five or 10 minute fight with them. You're just yeah. going and trying to get the, the injury and then, and then leaving. So I would say to answer your question, it would just be the basic common sense rules, you know, yeah. know, know where the exits are, know where the restrooms are, know, um, know the path really well. Certainly don't go off into an area where you might get lost if you're by yourself. Um, you know, this is not advice we had to give 25 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> you it's know, true. it's like it's it's, we're in a different world now completely. Yeah. Um, go with a partner if you can. Just make sure you can uh, reach out to somebody if you need to kind of thing. And all these things, you know, it, it's like walking into a restaurant or a theater for the first time, you know, just knowing where the exit is. Like just, yeah. just being environmentally aware of everything around you is always your best um like in a lot of self-defense programs, they teach it in zones. You know, there's a yellow zone, there's a red zone. Like you don't have to get that technical about it, but just having environmental awareness about what you're doing is uh, is important. And here's the other thing too. And, and a lot of this will become more clear as they watch the digital product and that kind of thing, right? But we talk about this thing, hitting the throat and doing all these devastating things. And, and to a socialized person, that sounds awful. Sure. And you mentioned that before, and I just want to revisit that for a second, because that's good. You know, you do want that to sound awful. We we are civilized people. We are enculturated people. We do want to take advantage of that. Um, but understand all that goes out the window if you are facing a predator. And it goes back to the very thing we talked about in the beginning, the empowering idea that you have just as much right to use the tool of violence at your disposal as anybody else does. And as my instructor said, Tim Larkin, and it's, it's a great quote, violence is rarely the answer, but when it is, it's the only answer, mm -hmm. you know? So if your back is really against the wall and you feel you really need to uh, get out of the situation, that's the time to use this. Yeah. Otherwise there are social cues, you know, they're saying, you know, stand back, you know, you can confront somebody who's far enough away from you if you feel they're a threat um through all the social cues that we discussed earlier yeah um yeah. what we're the, the kind of training you guys will receive and that i've been doing is when all that just disappears yeah you know and you're no longer in a domain of social politeness or or um respecting social cues from each other right 
Well, it's interesting. I, as you were saying that, I was thinking, you know, I, I'm in Colorado. There's some been some incidences out here with like, you know, wolves and all this kind of stuff. It's interesting yeah. because, you know, you would you would never hear or I, well, I, I doubt, you know, you would hear someone say if a bear comes out, you know, is attacked you, you have to do whatever it takes, take out its eyes, do whatever and get, you know, you have to stay alive. People are like, oh, yeah, that makes total sense. But I think it's so now that you're we're talking about this, I think the the place where people have the most problem because we're a socialized society is okay, but doing that same, you're not doing it to a bear, you're not doing it to a wolf, you're doing it to another human, right? Yeah. That's so it's not even at least the way how I'm thinking about it now. Probably people's hesitancy isn't even so much the violence part as it is you're you're not doing it to a wild animal, you're doing it to another person, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's I could I because again, I don't think most people would take issue with doing the things that we're talking about um to to a wild animal to save your life, right? Some. Some, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know like people from PETA would <laughs> well, well, check maybe, to that, right? <laughs> maybe that's true. But um, um but no it's a good point. And just I'll I'll say this about that also is just to understand that if if what's attacking you has a central nervous system, you know, then anything we're talking about, you know, could work, you know, you, you, you could break legs. You could, now animals are extremely, obviously they're in a completely different domain. They're, they're, they have much more jaw strength. They have just much more strength in general, especially if you're talking about bears and wolves and that kind of thing. So, but the same principles would apply, you know, mm -hmm. if you burrow through the eye or took out the eye of a wolf or a bear or something, but you would still get the same effect. Yeah. You know, they would be injured, they'd be incapable, but it doesn't mean they wouldn't stop fighting. A right. human being is a lot more likely to stop fighting, you know, with an injury. Yeah. Um sure. than an animal might. You know, an animal will, will likely fight to the death. And you see this in all the documentaries you see on cable TV, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's like they're still alive, even though that animal's like chopping them up and eating them. Right. Yeah. Um yeah. but it's I wouldn't say it's apples to oranges, but on some level it is because it's like I said, as long as they have a central nervous system, they are capable of being dismantled. Right. Understood. Understood. So, so a lot of the, uh, you know, when it comes to, for lack of a better word, self-defense, you know, a lot of these companies out there, you know, put out products or whatnot uh, for that purpose. So, you know, pepper spray, all these kind of things that, you know, I think a lot of, um, you know, people might tend to carry with them, especially again, if they're going to be running or cycling or whatever, uh, in isolated areas, what are your, what's your thought on carrying some of these things such as pepper spray, um, from a, you know, from a safety standpoint? They have their pluses and minuses. Um, okay. I would say in a real life or death situation, more minuses. Okay. Right? And I'll say that because of this, because, um, it's something you have to reach for. And let's just take pepper spray since you brought that one up, right? It, it's nothing that you're just going to have in your hand. You're not going to run with it in front of you like this, right? So if all <laughs> of a sudden you get jumped, it's something you have to access. Yeah. And in the process of accessing it, you have to ask yourself, would that time have been better spent actually just attacking the person with the knowledge mm -hmm. that you have? Um, you have to get it out. You have to actually apply it and spray it. Um, if somebody's coming after you who's a lifelong predator right uh very 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 high probability that they have been sprayed a lot and you can actually develop an immunity to it okay right so there there's a certain element of people out there you spray them they'll just laugh at you <laughs> you know it, it'll be like it'll be nothing to them uh wind you know you could be spraying it to them but if the wind's blown in the wrong direction it could like blow right back on oh, you great point right? um it's all sorts of issues. Uh, I was just talking to somebody the other day about the keys, right? People are like, well, what if I put the keys in my knuckles and, you know, use it like that? Um, the one thing I'll say about that is, you know, when you use a key or any type of object, it needs to be really secure. The problem with putting them in your knuckles is they're going to slide, mm -hmm. you know, so you might go to punch and even get a good scratch in there, but these things can slide right through your knuckles. If you look at prison footage, the reason they take a knife and they wrap and wrap and wrap and wrap their arm is so nothing slides. Interesting. Right. And then that knife just becomes an extension of their arm and they just keep shanking and shanking and shanking until the job's done. It's just one right? big lever at that point. It's one big lever at that point. Exactly. So it's, it's important to make sure if you're going to use a weapon that you have a lot of structure in holding it. So it doesn't just fall apart the second you, you use it to strike them. Got it. Does that make yeah. sense? Yep. 
So, you know, and the product we create, we'll, we'll go into weapons to a certain extent, you know, but, but at the end of the day, like we talked about earlier, it's always understanding what the real threat is and the real threat at the end of the day is always the mind. Yeah. The person's ability to injure you, not, not the weapon. And if you get too caught up with the weapon, it could be to your own detriment. Yeah, no, it makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so you've already mentioned some of these, uh, and again, we'll get into it obviously more, um, in, in the actual course, but what are some of the key targets on a human? Everybody knows them intuitively, right? Everybody knows your eyes are extremely vulnerable. You only have two of them. And if you can't see it's over, yeah. right? You can go back to karate kid. Part one, man can't stand, can't fight. <laughs> man can't see, can't fight. Right? It, it's really that, that simple. So you take out a knee, you take out an eye, but there's a lot of other ones that are um, more deeply recessed into the body, you know, like the kidneys, like the spleen, like there are other uh, more um, exotic targets for lack of a better word that, that you can also exploit. But basically it's anything on your body that you wouldn't want, you know, it's your, it's your most vulnerable part. You know, so obviously we know the reproductive organs on a guy, you know, yeah. the, the testicles, extraordinarily vulnerable. Um, same thing for women, though, right? Because any part of the body that's that sensitive, that's create capable of creating that much pleasure <laughs> is also created capable of creating that much pain. So women often ask that in classes, like, do we have the same impact? And women are far less likely to have the experiences we as guys have because we're external we have external reproductive organs. Yeah. So we're more vulnerable. So we're more likely to get the soccer ball into the groin <laughs> or, or the, um, the accidental kick, you know, and that kind of thing. So we experience it a lot more, but for women who haven't experienced it, yes, if they get struck hard enough in the reproductive organs, that they, that would be a devastating blow to them as well. Just a lot harder, you know, to, to get that kind of response. Um, so yeah, I would say knees, eyes, throat, ears. There's approximately 125 to 130, but a lot of them do repeat themselves. I see. Know? Like you have two knees, you have two eyes, you have two ears, right? Right. Um, the nose, like knowing how to attack the nose and knowing um, the, the temple, you know, there's, and when you think about, okay, there's 120, let's say to 130 roughly. And when you think of the combinations of how many combinations you can do of 130 different things, it's virtually infinite. Mm, sure. Right. I mean, that's just math. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's just like you, you take 130 objects and you just think, you, you just think of how many variations you have with 10 numbers. Right. Yeah. So you like add that to 130. And because it, when I teach the class and you teach like a certain way of striking a target, people sort of stick with that way, you know, but you have to understand that the target's the target. So it doesn't matter if you're hitting it uh, upside down or if you're on the ground or if they're on the ground, you know, it, it doesn't really matter it, as long as that target gets hit. Yeah. Like the way it's actually taught in class is not the only way it's going to go down. We just use that to illustrate it. And for as long as I've been studying this, like my instructors never repeated, you know, the same sequencing of events because mm. there's no need to. Sure. You know, there's yeah. a thousand ways you could teach to attack the eyes, you know? So, yeah. um, so you have a lot of variability at your disposal. It's just having the presence of mind, to know what's going on. Do I need to apply this? If I do, it's going to suck because as much as I or somebody else can teach you these techniques, what we can't teach you is intent. You know, are you ultimately going to have intent in that moment to actually get it done? Yeah. Um, do you really want to injure the person or kill the person? Right. And we've had people take courses that were very deep religious persuasions that wouldn't allow them to kill, but they found it academically fascinating to learn how to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. right? So whether you choose to, yeah, I thought so. So whether you choose to use this or not in, in the defining hour, which hopefully anybody watching this or anybody who's learns this doesn't never ever have to, that's what I always say in my classes. I always say, I hope this is the biggest waste of four hours and $50 <laughs> that you ever spend. <laughs> yeah. Like my sure. prayer is that you never, you just forget all this and you never have to apply it. Right. Yeah. But if you do, you're going to want to, you're, you're going to want to know it. You're going to want to remember it. And it's easy to remember because we're not teaching particular techniques. You're just teaching more principles. Yeah. And, yeah. and that that's an important thing, I think, because it's, again, if, if you had, right, if you had, if this was, uh, 
you know, okay, in this situation, do X, Y, Z. And then you take, okay, here's the 1000 situations. There's no person in the world that could remember that versus it's, yeah. it's simplified and much more efficient <laughs> to do, you know, in, uh, yeah, you know, because the inaccurate. probability, the mathematical probability of you ever getting attacked in a way that you rehearsed. Yeah. <laughs> it's really just not in your favor. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's just not, not going to happen that way. And yet yeah. that's the way a lot of self-defense is are taught. You know, somebody grabs a wrist. So you do this and then, you know, you do X, Y, Z. Yeah. It's very situational based, right? It's very situational based and very yeah. unlikely that you will be attacked in that manner. Violence yeah. is random at best. Yeah. And it's brutal. And it comes when you're not expecting it. Yeah. Um, you know, most people who are going to really do violence to you don't stand in open ready position. <laughs> right. Let's do violence, right? Yeah. They come in, they take your space. They hit you hard and there's no countering it. Yeah. Right. And that, and that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. So the other rules-based environment and techniques don't really apply in this kind yeah. of situation. And again, I, I want to also emphasize it. And I said this before that the type of person who would do this to you is a very small minority of people, but they do exist. Yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately. Yeah. So, so you alluded to this at the very beginning and, and you, you mentioned this before that, you know, the reason why this style, um, is, is so applicable to endurance athletes is, is because it was developed based off of, you know, where, where someone's exhausted and they don't have all those yeah. typical benefits. So, so training for this right? How would you train someone aside from knowing, okay, th these are the different parts on the body. This is, you know, all this kind of stuff. How do you train then, uh, to be exhausted? Do you, do you go out and do a marathon first and then you, <laughs> and then you practice or, or is, is there like based off your training, is there an optimal way to, to train in, in does, does exhaustion even factor into it when you're learning this stuff? Should you train exhausted or, or, or is that not really a factor? It's a great, great question. So when you first train, you train really slow. Okay. Like painfully slow because you're using the other person's body to figure these things out. Speed okay. is not the issue at all, right? Which is very counter to a lot of other types of fighting systems where you're trying to like, boom, 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 get in there as quickly as you can and get out, right? You can't do that in this, right? Because you can't slap somebody's ear with full force. The only thing that changes between training and the real world is the velocity, the speed at which you do it. Got it. Um, when you train originally, accuracy is all you're focusing on. Okay. You know, that's the most important part is you're going really slow. Are you, do you know where the targets are and are you hitting them with your fist, with your elbow, with whatever part of your anatomy that you, you want to hit them with? Um, Accuracy is everything, and that comes from going really, really, really slow. As you curate a training partner, and you've both been doing it for a long time, yes, you can pick up the speed because you know each other, and then it kind of becomes like a dance with one another, you know? Um, because just as important as it for you to hit the targets, the person you're working with has to know how to give the, the right reaction because you're not going to hit them hard enough to actually get the reaction. <laughs> right? Let's hope not. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd be you know very short on partners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, so it's very important for them to understand what the reaction is and provide it. Okay. You know, once you hit. Um, the other thing I'm going to say about that is, so there's this thing in they call the adrenaline dump and in a real life situation if it involves guns if you feel like your life is in at stake and all that kind of thing it's um you have a lot of adrenaline pumping up through the body right and they call it the adrenaline dump because time takes on a different meaning when you're in, really in a life or death situation like it goes at a completely different rate uh because you have so much adrenaline going you don't even know like i know personally know people who have been stabbed and didn't feel it till the fight mm. was over, right? Because you have so much adrenaline going through you. And it's like afterwards, you're like, oh, I'm bleeding. Oh, there's a knife in me. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. But, but but you don't feel it in that moment because you're just yeah. so jacked with adrenaline. Now, the adrenaline dump doesn't last very long, right? Because the body can only stay at that heightened state for so long. Um, sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system, right? So as things start tempering down, you wind up in a position where... Uh, you're going to start to feel the pain. So you're asking, is it good to train that way? In my training, yeah, we had to do that. But how do we get to the adrenaline dump phase of exhaustion, mm -hmm. you know, without 
going there for real. And we do that through time. Okay. You know, so when I, when I tested, you no, know, I did my final test. I was actually going up with a guy actually bigger than I am. And we, what they call did free fighting for 45 minutes. Hmm. Right. So in the beginning, you're just, you know, you're, you're, you're full of energy. So you're doing all the, the fancy stuff, the footwork, the throws, like all the cool stuff. Right. But then what you're really getting evaluated is not like that first 40 minutes. You're really getting tested on that final five minutes. Okay. Right. Cause that's where you're just ex exhausted for 45 minutes. You're hitting the mat and getting up approximately every five to seven seconds. Wow. Right. So that becomes very exhausting. So, so they, they push you. And I'm not saying you need to do this, you know, in order to be competent. This stuff is just the path I took because I, I chose to pursue this as a, as a system. Um, but that's what best um, sort of like facilitates that that adrenaline dump is, okay. is, is, is through time. So they really test you in that final five minutes. What are you doing in that final five minutes as you're targeting on track? you know, is, is is your structure on track or is, is your spine collapsing? Are you, you know, are you doing all the things that would normally happen under duress? Okay. So that was the safest way to get somebody to respond with this type of style of fighting um, absent the, uh, the actual adrenaline dump. Got it. Okay. But again, I want to emphasize it's like people see the digital class and just do a little training on their own. It's not absolutely necessary to do that. Right. Right. Yeah, it, it's cool, but it, I, I wouldn't say it's, you know, it's not a necessity or anything. It's not a, yeah, it's not a necessity. Um, you know, like I said before, it's like you learn how to slap the ear. As long as you can clap loud, you know how to do that. You don't have to practice mm. that over and over. Yeah. But again, will you have the will and intent to do it in that situation is, is always, always the big question. Yeah. And a lot of that comes down to like literally you, your God, your existential self, or whatever you happen to believe in. Right. As, as to whether you would actually go that far with a person. Yeah. Um, you know, mothers, like I have no doubt they would. Yeah. You know, because if they're have they're protecting a child, like there's no end to what they would do to protect the child. Sure. Fair. You know, it's it's amazing what can come out of women when they're mothers. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um and, and you see it all the time, right? In the in the news, right? Like, you know, often with unfortunate consequences where the you know, the mom's life ends because they're protecting their child. But yeah, but yeah, it's uh you're absolutely right. Um, so you also covered this before, but I th I think it's important to to reiterate for, for the last question here of this podcast, because I think, you know, uh while we're not this is this is obviously for everyone, male, female, small, big, whatever, it, it's all mm -hmm. applicable. Um, but just knowing that again, what we see in the news so much and hear in the news so much about about women being attacked. Um does the size and does the weight um of the attacker change the response um everything that you're saying to me no it doesn't change your response but i, I guess i just want to stay on this topic a little bit more just because i think that is a question probably a lot of people will have and like hey if what, what if someone's 400 pounds and i'm 80 pounds again you already yeah. we already talked about it but if you could just sort of elaborate on that again well i'll give you a good example um somebody i know very well very short woman who i you know took many classes i've trained personally for a while <clears throat> and again, sometimes this takes a little while to, to sink in, but I'll never forget. She approached me one time and she's like, I kind of get it. I'm like, what? She goes, I can visualize myself now running up to you, taking both hands, slapping your ears. And I didn't teach her this, right? She's, she's okay. just putting all together. Okay. Stabbing your ears, dropping my weight, pulling your mm. ears down. As you're coming down, my knee going into your groin. Interesting. Right? She was like finally like taking all this stuff that I was yeah, teaching. She her. got finally it. Finally saw a way that she at her at her height could actually apply it. Yeah. And yeah, lesson learned. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. good job, Russ Hopper, right? But yeah. it, it, it sometimes it takes a while to get there because we always assume from the type of competitive martial arts that we watch, wrestling, boxing, that it's always bigger, faster, stronger, who wins. Sure. Right. But in this domain, it's really if if you took two of the instructors who trained myself for example and you put them in a life or death situation like if you blink you'll miss it it's going to happen that fast mm -hmm. it's going to be who's going to get in there first and who's going to get the first shot in yeah, yeah. you know and how brutal is that first yeah. shot going to be yeah. and and, and it, it's really that simple even though there's a whole curriculum to kind of learn it and understand it you know at, at its fundamental level it's that simple 
Yeah. But, but that, but that's a great point though, that you made about, about fighting, you know, in, in sport fighting, right? Because everything with weight class, right? Like you're not going to yeah. put a, you're not going to put a featherweight in there with, with, with Mike Tyson, right? Cause you know what the result's going to be right. clearly. Right. So, but I think because in people extrapolate probably fighting sport fighting to what this is, you know, um, that, that don't have a lot of understanding of this and that makes sense. Right. And then, so therefore bigger, stronger, faster will always defeat lighter, smaller, right. Because in that, in that sports context. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're it's exactly to your point, you're always matching up weight classes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's, um, so it's very hard to get a realistic feel and take on what you're really capable of in, in those kind of situations. Yeah, as you're always seeing, you know, and and that's good and that's great, you know, and and like sure. I said, competitive fighting is amazing, and I've done it myself. It's 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 awesome, but it's not this. Yeah, it's apples and oranges. It's two completely. It's apples and oranges. Yeah, exactly, completely, and um, and that's why the history of it was so fascinating to me. You know, that it started out like I said with these two guys, Applegate and Fairbairns, and they they weren't looking at fighting systems you know they weren't saying no oh, let's bring the best judo guy in here i mean they studied those things right but basically it came down to and bruce lee did this a little bit himself like how do we distill the best out of all this to be the most devastating um the only difference was this body of work had a lot of um money behind it and academia behind it and white papers written on it and you know it really just became a course in like how to um produce blunt trauma to the body you know, to, to exact, you know, one of the most devastating effects, but yes, so you're right. And I don't, I always, and here's the other thing too, I've learned, especially with women, it's, and I'll just say this for all the women, you know, listening it, like you have the right to do this, you know, it's your domain. It, it's your right to protect yourself. Um, women who might not be mothers yet might feel like, oh, I would never want to hurt somebody that bad, even if they're clearly hurting you. Right. So you have the right to use this tool of violence just as much as the other person does. Yeah. And, you know, you hear these stories about these like women who are abducted, thrown in trunks and everything. And it's like, it breaks my heart, obviously. Right. Cause like if I had, if I had been in her life, somebody else had been in her life and like taken the time to like teach her these things, you know, maybe she wouldn't have gotten into the trunk, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe it wouldn't have escalated to that point. Right. But, the last thing you want to do in that kind of situation is not know what to do. Sure. Right? So, so, and that's why this gives you like a map of the body. So you're not just like closing your eyes willy nilly and trying to strike and hope that something happens. Yeah. You know, once you understand the anatomy, you become very focused. That target becomes your entire world, mm -hmm. you know, your entire world until it's over yeah. and you'll know it's over because they've been injured. And then it doesn't matter how enraged they are. You know, if I've smashed somebody's medial malleolus in, in the ankle, right, um, doesn't even matter if they're cracked up on cocaine or crystal meth or whatever, they're functionally useless now. Like yeah. they will try to stand and the body just won't support itself. And that's what we're looking to accomplish with this type of study and this type of understanding. Yeah, no, that's a great way to sort of bring it all together. Um, so. For, for the listeners uh, th that are listening or watching this, uh, as James and I alluded to, James and I, or James specifically, I should say, is creating a a course specifically based around this um, for uh, for all of our coaches and anyone that wants it. It's going to, because of the importance of this, James and I decided we'll, we're going to be offering this course for free. Um, it'll be on USCA's website. It'll be... Um, it's in sort of in the very early stages of development now, and we'll be posting about this on USCA um, and uh, and advertising it out there. But it'll be available for anyone who wants to take it, USCA coach or not, um, because we think it's it's that important. Um, one thing that we're also going to be doing um, on the outro of this, we'll be posting a link uh, to people that want to learn more about the history of this, how this sort of came to be, what the origins of this are. Um, uh, James alluded earlier about his website, Inner Athlete, um, so we'll be posting the. the the website URL to that as well. Um, so James, thank you so much for, for coming on to this. And yeah, I hope we pleasure. can obviously do this again. Yeah. And if I could just say one, one last thing. Yeah. That part of the inner athlete training brand is to go into the history of physical culture. So I'm happy to post this video that goes into the history of this fighting system because history is important to me. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's always important to sort of know the, the root of you know, what you're learning. And I think it's going to post like a nine minute video. And, and I think if people take the time to watch it, they'll sort of see the origins of where this whole thing began. 
um, with two amazing guys back in like the 1930s and 40s, you know, uh, um, who were fighting in Shanghai during some of the most worst times and everything. It was just, but it's a really compelling story. And uh, I think it'll give them even a deeper perspective um, in conjunction with the discussion you and I just had about where this all comes from and why it's valuable and how it's valuable. Yep. Awesome. Well, well, thank you so much, James. And like I said, to, to all the listeners, we'll be uh, keeping you all up, uh, updated as, as things continue to get developed and once it launches for this course. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. James, thank you so much for being on the thank podcast you, today. It's been a pleasure. Yep. Thanks. Bye-bye.